good morning to you all. We will proceed now with the opening ceremony for this school on uh, atomic quantum fluids. To compose the opening table, I would like to invite Professor Silvio Quezado, representing the director of the center, and Professors Vanderlei Bagnato and Jose, uh, excuse me, Daniel Klepner to compose the opening table. This workshop is being organized, this school, excuse me, is being organized by the International Center for Condensed Matter Physics as part of its academic program for the period 2006-2007. The organization of this school is made possible thanks to the sponsorship of the Ministry of Science and Technology through its funding agencies, FINEP and CNPQ, and through the Ministry of Education through its funding agency, CAPES. Also, we have the important contribution to this work to this school by FAPESP, the state agency from Sao Paulo, and the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, have also contributed to this event. Uh, we will now proceed with the opening of the ceremony, uh, giving the floor to Professor Silvio Quezado, who will give you the official welcome by ICCMP. Good morning. This is a brief uh, opening ceremony, and uh, my duty here is, uh, on behalf of the director of the center, to welcome all of you, and thanks to Professor Daniel Kepler and uh, Vanderlei Bagnato for their effort to organize uh, this uh, meeting. Our center is now completing 20 years old, and uh, we think that uh, this uh, is one more step that uh, the center is doing in favor of condensed matter physics in Brazil. So uh, our rector just uh, phoned us. Uh, he could not uh, come, but most likely he will be around uh, during the event. Uh, to welcome you uh, too. Let me just uh, give uh, some some notes. Those of you who receive any kind of sponsor from the center, please uh, do not forget to handle your ID to the secretary uh, and uh, the receipt of your ticket in case you have uh, received one from us or from uh, uh, Sao Paulo. The will be around uh, during this event, uh, and any time you need anything, please uh, do not hesitate to contact us. There are some uh, office uh, available for you to stay here in, in between uh, the, the talks. And uh, let me just advise that uh, in this moment we have a small constructor nearby, so uh, we'll try not to make any, any noise uh, during the session, but uh, avoid to be in the next area on the ground floor. Other than that, uh, please uh, do not hesitate to contact us uh, if you have any, any question or if you need uh, some help to find your way uh, here in Brasilia or at the university. So once more, welcome to Brasilia and welcome to our university. We are very honored to have among us in this school uh, Professor Wolfgang Ketterle, uh, Nobel Prize winner of physics 2001. We will now hear the scientific directors of this event, Professor Vanderlei Bagnato and Professor Daniel Klepner. When Vandalay told me about this school and asked whether I would help to co-organize it, my immediate reaction was yes, for several reasons. One, purely selfish. We have many friends in Brazil. I have been here before. I like this country, so this is an opportunity to visit. But beyond that was the fact that this school was being organized in the Center for Condensed Matter Theory which to me is very significant because one of the changes in the field as will emerge is there's been a sea change and uh, previously disparate fields, atomic physics and condensed matter physics, now have a bridge between them and the school is 
one way to help strengthen that bridge. Another reason is that uh, as a member of the Center for Ultra-Cold Atoms at MIT, the idea immediately resonated because the CUA uh, has put on summer schools before, and uh, it's one of the things that we kind of like doing. So when I asked our director, who is Wolfgang Ketterle, uh, about this, his response was immediately the same as my own. Um, yes, let's do it, and can we be a co-sponsor of it? So we are honored to be a co-sponsor of this meeting. And there will be several of the speakers here are from the CUA. And um, so for these various reasons, I'm really very happy to participate, and so is the Center for Ultra-Cold Atoms. Well, good morning to everybody. I would like to thank all the students for coming. And uh, this is a school, it's not a workshop or a conference. And uh, it's a school in a field that uh, is coming up to be, as Dan was saying, uh, a real and fascinating uh, field that entangles many other fields. You know, recently there was an article in Physics Today showing that how quantum fluids is influenced astrophysics, uh, condensed matter, uh, atomic physics, of course, but many other fields around nuclear physics. So it is, uh, for, uh, for those reasons, it's touching so many fields that's very important for us to incentivate and to motivate our young students for this area. And uh, I was also invited to organize this is cool by the center. So I received this invitation, say, oh, we should put together a school here. And uh, as Dan already mentioned, I invite uh, him to help. And as you know, Dan Kleppner, uh, he's not only helping putting together, but he also motivate even more the importance of having this school here in Brazil. And uh, I would like to thank Dan for this. Dan Kleppner is uh, not only uh, the mentor of this field, you know, he's working in both condensation uh, in the experimental point of view before uh, everybody that I know, starting the hydrogen experiments and everything. And, uh, but uh, he's also responsible for the graduation of uh, many, many people that are in this field. So, we used to say that he is the father of Bose condensation. And uh, so it's a pleasure that he helped us in putting together this school. And uh, for the center here, you can see the wall, the history that they have. And uh, Brazil is making a, a great uh, effort, not only to do science, but uh, to make sure that we are providing directions and opportunity for the young students. And one of the reasons of having this center is for that, for organizing and putting together students, not only of Brazil, but all around and uh, from other continents as well. And uh, we happy to be part of these efforts to organize one more. And our poster is there already, I guess. <laughs> and uh, so, we are automatically part of the history of this center. Uh, I want to thank you all the lectures. You know, I know how hard it is to leave your lab for one day, imagine for one week or two weeks. When you go back, it's not like things has been stopped and it's just gonna continue. I mean, you find a, a pile of things at the desk and emails and everything you have to deal with. So having here the major authors or the major players on this uh, Bose condensation for this school is really a good pleasure and uh, we all thank you very much for that. Uh, we want to thank you, everybody that's giving support, starting from MIT, that's a co-sponsor, and uh, FAPESP, CNPQ, CAPS, FINEP, everybody's giving a little bit that uh, Integrate is making possible for us to run this 
small school. And uh, we're gonna, you see, I think uh, when we came with the idea, Dan said, okay, but has to be a real school. Students has to learn. And in fact, uh, Dan said, well, we should start uh, with fundamentals and uh, he'll be the first teacher and you'll be impressed because he's gonna use the blackboard. It is a green board, but to really give this uh, characteristic of school. We be framing all the lectures and we're gonna produce a DVD collection so other people has can, can also see even if they are not here. So I, I'm going to ask you to the lectures to remember that you're being recorded and that will be a lecture in DVD, probably in the internet, that other people can see. So try to remember that and that your audience is much broader than the people that are here. And uh, we're gonna have every day here a lunch I understand that that is a nice restaurant. And uh, oh, that's reminded me to thank Anna Claudia, which uh, is the local secretary, and uh, Isabel and Bene, which are the secretaries in São Carlos. They all help to put it together, even though it's a, we have uh, 80 participants that apply for the school. Uh, it takes uh, a lot of job to responded to all the requests and everything so we would like all to thank uh, Anna Claudia, Isabel and uh, Bene for helping. Uh, so every day we're gonna have lunch uh, and then uh, we continue in the afternoon. I think there will be a coffee break in between so we have a chance to talk more and I would like to m incentivate the students really to contact the lecturers and uh, talk. The lecturers, don't, they don't need to be on the, on this, in this room all the time. That There are offices that are located for them because we consider that you have to prepare your lecture. <laughs> but in fact, there uh, is an office that uh, if you are not lecturing and you don't want to see the, what's going on, you can be there working and continue doing, you know, taking care of your life. And. Uh, so what else do I, I have to say? Oh, there is some small changes in the program. So Wednesday, we're gonna have uh, uh, one seminar by Giacomo Roati uh, after lunch. And uh, before we go in, in a free time, with uh, free means free, but uh, we're gonna try to fill it up with something that uh, we are still discussing what you can do in that free time. And uh, we are now sitting together after the school start to see the possibility of uh, giving some addition, additional support for the students because uh, you have to take care of yourself for the, l the dinner and everything. And for the lecture as well, there will be also a kind of support for helping. And uh, this will come now after uh, me and the secretary gets together and see everything we can do. So once more, I would like to thank everybody. And I want you to start with the spirit that the school was organized, which is really a school. You should feel free to raise your, ran, uh, your hand and ask questions. And uh, the use the microphone because uh, your questions will also be recorded. <laughs> And uh, well, I wish uh, all of us a nice school. It's a two weeks of school. And uh, we hope it will be very profitable. And uh, we're all gonna leave these two weeks uh, not tired, but uh, encouraged and motivated for this very nice field. So thank you very much to all of you. And uh, I think we are now sharp nine o'clock, which is time to start the first lecture. Thank you. This is North American flora. It does not compete with Brazilian flora, but that's my screensaver. Also, I wonder whether 
um, I'm going to use PowerPoint just to begin with, and whether we could turn the light down a bit in the front, it's, it's uh, rather dull there. Well, I guess you can see it. Okay. Um, as Vandelay explained, that um, I think both of us resonated to the idea of this school because it was I the idea to reach out to a new community. So uh, my um, working assumption was that the audience here was coming from another area, from the area of condensed matter physics. So uh, that uh, my lectures would start really at ground zero, teaching the most fundamental things. Now, this audience looks to me pretty sophisticated. It's hard to tell an atomic physicist just by looking at them, but I see quite a few here in the audience. And to them, I'll just have to apologize that uh, I may be telling you things which are uh, so elementary that uh, they're not worth your attention. But um, at least it'll help to normalize the group. But before uh, talking about that, since I am really addressing a, um, an audience from a different culture, I thought it'd be worth spending some time to sort of introduce you to the field of atomic physics, to explain how it got where it is today and, uh, and where it is today. So this is a prelude, it's a digression. It's for your cultural enrichment. It is not going to help you professionally, except perhaps to inspire you uh, when we see some of the achievements of the past and some of the things which have come out of those achievements. So what I want to do is to talk about atomic physics today and where it came from. Well, of course, uh, it comes from the earliest roots of physics uh, in the, well, it would go back even before the 18th century if one wishes, but I'm not gonna go back quite that far. Um, I would like to go back to where one can sort of see the roots of atomic physics as we know it right now. In the year 1900, atomic physics was essentially physics, that uh, most, or at least a large fraction of the papers which were published, if you had to classify them, you would classify them as atomic physics. But of course, in those days, which seemed very romantic, looking back, one didn't distinguish between these different areas. It was all just physics. So what I want to do is to start back in 1923, and trace the development, it's a rather artificial way, but I think it's a pretty good way just by looking at the Nobel Prizes. Uh, I think this is perhaps justified because the Nobel Prizes are awarded for work which has major impact, and so we can see the steps which brought atomic physics to where it is today. Um, but the, um, the Nobel Prizes, of course, don't cover all areas very few prizes are given. There are many great accomplishments. So it's rather sparse history, but it does nonetheless cover the highlights. And I realize I have left my laser pointer. All right, why start in 1923? Or actually, th that was 1943 to 2005. I'm sorry, that was a misprint. I'd like it to start in 1943, uh, because that when the, the prize was awarded to um, Otto Stern, for the stern gerlach experiment. As you recall, the stern gerlach experiment was which an experiment which proved the reality of spatial quantization using a molecular beam and deflecting the beam according to the magnetic sublevels the atom was in. That experiment had a revolutionary impact on the thinking about quantum mechanics at the time. Of course, this is before modern quantum theory was developed, but quantum ideas were very much in the air. And uh, most people did not believe them. Uh, Max Planck did not believe them. Uh, most of the community did not believe them. A young postdoc with uh, Otto Stern was I.I. Robbie. And uh, Robbie told me about the impact at the time, that it was electrifying to the physics community to actually see spatial quantization. It meant there was something physically real about, uh, about the quantum ideas. So it had this uh, electrifying effect in advancing the acceptance of quantum theory. It also advanced an ex 
important experimental technique, the experimental technique of molecular beams, and that plays a role in the subsequent developments I want to talk about. Now, the prize, the work was done in 1923. The prize was given in 1943. It actually was awarded in 1944, because this was during the war, and uh, it was not awarded in, in Stockholm. It was actually awarded in New York City, and both the prizes were actually awarded in the same ceremony. Uh, th that Robbie got the prize for inventing molecular beam magnetic resonance. Now, um, the impact of that experimental discovery is really too vast to characterize because it underlies all of the developments in atomic physics since then, or at least most of them. It underlies the development of nuclear magnetic resonance. It underlies the development of the lasers, of optical pumping, of atom cooling, of Bose-Einstein condensation. So this, really, this work really was seminal. And one of the first uh, major applications of the new resonance ideas was to nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, and Bloch and Purcell received the Nobel Prize in 1952 for th that discovery. It also had a profound effect on developing the application of these new resonance ideas to fundamental tests. Maybe the most fundamental question that was, uh, that was uh, on the table in atomic physics at the time, or really physics in general, uh, the Dirac theory was one of the great triumphs of quantum theory, the early developments of quantum theory, that many theorists consider Dirac's theory as the greatest theoretical accomplishment of the uh, 20th century. But there were suspicions that the Dirac theory was not complete. And, uh, and Willis Lamb actually proved this conclusively around 1948 an interesting concurrence of a new theoretical, uh, new theoretical developments where people were quite sure that there were problems with the Dir Dirac theory. <coughs> but it also shows the importance of new experimental techniques. The underlying technique was the um, invention of magnetic resonance. But beyond that was the development of microwave methods in the radar projects during World War II. That technological development had huge implications for the advancement of science. And it's one of the interesting cases where one can see how new technology advances science. When we try to explain science to our friends and particularly try to justify the expenditures on science to the um, funding agencies, one always stresses the great uh, new technologies which come out of new science. And that's certainly true. But it works the other way around. And certainly the development of microwave techniques during World War II had a huge impact on the furthering of science. And one of those was that, uh, that Willis Lamb had these techniques at his disposal. It was realized about that time in 1948, as soon as Lamb saw his results, uh, it was realized that there, there, there were problems with the Dirac theory. And one of the implications of that was that the magnetic moment of the electron was not correctly given by the Dirac theory. That th this was particularly pushed by a young protege of I.I. Robbie's there, who was Julian Stringer. And what they did was to push an experiment to measure the hyperfine separation of hydrogen in which this effect would also take place. But, and R Robbie actually carried out such an experiment. Uh, but they also designed an experiment, a molecular beams experiment, specifically to show that. And they did. And Cush shared in the Nobel Prize for showing that the magnetic moment of the electron was not given by the Dirac theory. Well, these ideas of resonance were spreading broadly. And resonance, of course, Robbie's first uh, executed these ideas with magnetic resonance, molecular beam magnetic resonance. But the same ideas can be applied to other forms of interactions in atoms. And uh, Charlie Towns was at Columbia University. Robbie was at Columbia University. There was a golden age of Columbia University. Robbie had a great instinct for 
choosing really smart people. And he had brought there, at first as a postdoc and then as a young faculty member, Charlie Towns. Towns was very interested in microwave spectroscopy for studying molecular structure with a particular interest in looking for uh, molecules in space. In the course of working on, uh, on molecular uh, and electric beam resonance, uh, Towns hit upon the idea of the maser and started uh, creating a maser at Columbia University. Uh, he does recount, he's written a very interesting autobiography. He does recount, though, how uh, Robbie uh, went into his lab one day and looked at the work and asked what he was doing, and, uh, and Towns explained, and Robbie said, waste of time, why don't you do something more useful? Um, th that just shows that Robbie was a great physicist, but he liked to make uh, sweeping generalizations. Often they were right, sometimes they were wrong, and for the young students, there is a moral in this. It is, of course, always good to speak to wise and experienced people and hear their opinions on things, uh, but you mustn't always take them as gospel truth because you can easily get talked out of doing good experiments. Well, if you're really good, you won't get talked out of doing a good experiment, and Towns was really good, and he carried on, and he invented the maser, um, and at the same time, there was great interest in, in the Soviet Union, and Basov and Prokhorov also uh, worked on and created a maser. At the time, the, 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 the incentive for making these masers was to make a better type of atomic clock, Robbie himself had, was the first person to propose the possibility of an atomic clock, but he never pursued it because he was interested in basic science and not in advancing technology. Um, but out of this idea for the maser grew the idea of the laser, and by 1964, the laser had been demonstrated. Well, the, the next group that we have on here, Tomonaga, Schwinger, and Feynman, would norm, not normally classify themselves as atomic physicists. These were great theoretical physicists of great breadth. But as very young people, they had actually uh, revised the Dirac theory, revised quantum electrodynamics, invented the theory of relativistic quantum electrodynamics, which is always trotted out as one of the greatest success stories in physics because this theory is so accurate that it has been checked now to about a part in 10 to the 12th. And when one wants to make the claim that physics is a quantitative subject, there is no uh, better example to use than th this agreement between the predictions of quantum electrodynamics and the measurements to that precision. But beyond that, it is the model for modern relativistic, all modern field theories. Okay. So here again, we have an example of how something which started in physics to understand this discrepancy in the magnetic moment of the electron has had much broader uh, implications for the advance of science. Okay. Alfred Kastler, really working by himself in Paris, starting as a high school teacher before the war, had been fascinated by the possibilities, uh, by polarized light. And he, he viewed polarized light not kind of as a wave phenomenon, but as a form in which you could transfer angular momentum into an atomic system. And working with his postdoc, Rossell, they actually executed that and showed that you could uh, align the angular momentum of ground state atoms. And most of the angular momentum is in the spin of the nucleus. So you could uh, put atoms into particular nuclear spin states through optical methods. Now, th th in retrospect, that was a very important step, although one didn't realize its significance at the time, because this was the first time that one could actually manipulate the internal states of atoms. Now, the, out of that uh, ability came lots of useful experiments, new resonance techniques and such, and new types of atomic clocks. But in the history there were, we're looking at today, it represents a major advance in uh, atomic control. Uh, it, and, and there's also a, a very interesting sideline to that, that Brossel's, uh, Jean Brossel, who was uh, Kastler's postdoc, who had been actually sent to MIT to work with Francis Bitter, who was very well known for his work in developing high magnetic fields, 
on this, um, had a correspondence with Castler, and these ideas gradually emerged. And one of the very interesting things was that the first experiment to demonstrate optical pumping uh, was actually drawn, uh, sent to Castler by Brossel. They were working very closely together on this. And we don't think of optical pumping particularly as an atomic beams method, but in fact, the first experiments were. It came as a great discovery that you could align the nuclei of atoms in a gas which underwent many collisions and the alignment would be preserved. That was just one of these bits of good fortune that no one really had thought about ahead of time. Um, but when it came, it made these experiments much, much simpler, much more universal. And uh, if there's a moral in that, it is that sometimes things work out much better than you expect. Um, of course, not always. And I might say that uh, I know that uh, Castler really was a wonderful person as a mentor to the scientific community, he helped to reconstruct science in France after the war. Uh, was always deeply regretful that uh, Brossel did not share the Nobel Prize with him. Of course, he had no control over that. Uh, and Brossel himself seemed to take that in good stand. Okay, the next, uh, uh, next prize, it, it was to Niccolo Bloombergen. These, were, these prizes were for three different uh, topics altogether. Niccolo Bloombergen really for um, inventing nonlinear uh, optics. Uh, as he described it, he was at Harvard at the time. I was at ha Harvard University as a graduate student working with Norman Ramsey, and uh, a number of these people were there. Purcell was there, Bloombergen was there, and of course, so was Ramsey. <coughs> um, uh, Bloombergen simply took the standard uh, uh, optical text, Born and Wolf, said he went through it and made all the linear terms nonlinear, and saw what happened. Well, that's kind of oversimplifying it, but of course, nonlinear optics has had major technological uh, implications, and um, it also uh, sort of opened new areas of, of spectroscopy uh, and of optics, basically started a new optics. Shallow got the Nobel Prize um, for the advances in laser spectroscopy, saturation spectroscopy. This is a technique which made laser spectroscopy very practical for looking at atoms which are moving around very rapidly. Um, this, this work certainly took place in his laboratory. My own uh, interpretation of this is that the uh, Nobel Committee really felt rather badly for not uh, having Shallow share the Nobel Prize with Towns in the first place for the creation of the laser and were sort of making amends. And certainly this work in his lab on saturation spectroscopy uh, was um, uh, of Nobel quality, but the chief scientist who did that was actually Ted Hench, who went to work with Shallow as, uh, as a young postdoc and kind of revolutionized the field by making laser spectroscopy practical. Um, so I feel that uh, Ted kind of unfairly lost out on that one, but he's a very versatile person, and as you know, uh, he has received the Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, K. Sigbon uh, got the prize for, I guess it's Kai Sigbon, uh, for electron scattering work, which was done. Uh, his father, also Mani Sigbon, had gotten the Nobel Prize in much the same area. Uh, and I read just last week that K. Sigbon has recently died. Well, the person I know best is Norman Ramsey because he was my thesis advisor. Uh, and uh, he got the Nobel Prize he could have gotten it for so many things that they must have had difficulty making up their minds. Uh, but uh, they, they awarded it to him for advances in high precision spectroscopy, the op the what's called the Ramsey method, the double oscillatory field method, and its application to the hydrogen maser. Well, um, Ramsey did many other things. He started the search for parity non-conservation effects in atoms. He introduced the uh, concepts of negative absolute temperatures. Um, and of course, the, the Ramsey method itself has been enormously important. It's used in most atomic clocks. So it was quite, uh, uh, quite appropriate that it, that it be awarded. And they could have been, it's one of these awards which could have come 30 years earlier. Um, but um, anyway, it was nice that it came then. Uh, I might say, though, that they slightly missed the boat on that. They talked about the separated oscillatory field method 
and its application to the hydrogen maser. What the hydrogen maser does is not actually use that method. So they got the physics a little bit wrong on that. But I was happy they got it wrong because I, a, as a graduate student and young postdoc, I worked with Norman on the invention of the hydrogen maser. So it's a pet, uh, it's a pet project of mine. Daymelt got the experiment and they got the prize for measuring the uh, magnetic moment of the electron more accurately than it had ever been done before to about uh, roughly a part in 10 to the 11th. Now, this provided a new precision test of QED, quantum electrodynamics. Quantum electrodynamics is doing very well. There is no uh, reason right now to doubt its validity in the low energy region. Nonetheless, the ability to apply it and calculate it is it, it's not an easy thing to do. It's a very demanding task. So this represented a new level in the agreement between theory and experiment. More importantly, though, Daymelt had the vision to carry out experiments on one particle. He was the first person to carry out a precision measurement on a single electron. And the ability to measure single particles right now, to look at them and observe them, is a very important part of the arsenal of tools in atomic physics. And it's to Daymelt that we have that, that vision. Powell invented the, um, the radio frequency, the radio frequency ion trap. It's very closely associated with the techniques that Daymelt used. It opened up new forms of mass spectroscopy. Uh, and uh, ion trapping experiments today, of which there are quite a few, sort of owe their origins to this work of, um, uh, of Powell. So now we come to the modern era, 1997 to 2005. And these were all centered, well, th the first six were centered around the discovery of Bose-Einstein condensation. What made Bose-Einstein condensation possible was the creation of laser cooling methods. And these methods were uh, developed by Steve Chu, Claude Cohn-Fanucci, and Bill Phillips. Others had been working on that, too. They were not the only people in the field, but I think anyone looking at it objectively sees that what they did really led the field and moved it forwards. Eric Cornell, Wolfgang Ketterle, and Carl Wyman received it in 2001 for the discovery of Bose-Einstein condensation. When Bose-Einstein condensation was discovered, it made headlines around the world. Um, fortunately, the investigators were clever enough to label it Bose-Einstein condensation rather than quantum, uh, quantum degenera degeneracy in a, a quantum Bose gas. Uh, if you'd called it that, it would not have gotten into the newspapers at all. Degeneracy sounds slightly tawdry. But the important thing is that it's missing the magic name of Einstein, which properly belongs there. Now, it created great excitement and some skepticism about the level of excitement at the time. But um, the skepticism, the skepticism, I might say, came from the condensed matter theory, uh, the condensed matter community, particularly the liquid helium community, who pointed out that Bose condensation was not new. It was known in liquid helium, and the atomic physicists are just terribly naive, um, and uh, who they think they are anyway, stepping into our territory. Well, th that was rather short-lived. Uh, it turns out that the phenomena is entirely different when viewed with these atomic quantum gases, and has led to many other new things. In any case, it caused a sensation then, and that sensation continues to today. Uh, the most recent prizes went, well, here is one <coughs> prize to Roy Glauber, which again could have given, been given 30 years ago um, for the development of really the theory of quantum optics, the coherent field. His work had a huge impact in changing optics, bringing it into the, into the 20th century, now the 21st century. And John Hall and Ted Hench received it for the development of the optical frequency cone. A, me a practical method for measuring the frequency of light. I know that had been a dream of Ted for many, many years, that the uh, laser spectroscopy had gotten better and better, uh, but it, a it, out it had outrun the, the possibilities for, um, for of measurement. 
simply because previously one measured the wavelength of light very, very accurately, but that you could, can't do that to better than about a part in 10 to the 10th, and lasers could measure to much higher precision. But unless there was some way of knowing the frequency of the laser, the measurement was useless. There were techniques for measuring laser frequencies, but they were very laborious. Every measurement required basically a new laboratory. And then Ted had the vision of developing this general method, which lets you measure the easily the frequency of any light. And John Hall, who was an early expert in high precision uh, laser spectroscopy, helped to implement that by making it more general. And that really is a revolutionary technology. Well, here we have within, uh, this is eight years, there are nine Nobel Prizes in this field, which suggests that the field is really hopping. Uh, and in fact, the field really is hopping. But if one looks back altogether at these, two things emerged when I looked at them. Um, the Nobel Prize is given because work has impact. You know, it isn't given for promise. Uh, it's given for work which has a visible impact on the field. So in each case, this work had a visible impact. But the, looking back on it, the impact was just much larger than people could have dreamt of at the time. So uh, this is a very nice moral to see. If you like, it's a short-sightedness of scientists, even the best people in the world trying to decide who should get a Nobel Prize uh, and doing their best to do it, that the reality of these dreams always exceeds the expectations at the time. That's a very nice quality about, uh, about science. It's one of the areas, uh, one of the activities in human affairs where things frequently work out much better than you could expect. Often things work out not as well as you can expect, you know. The slums do not go away, the wars do not stop. Uh, society has a hard time organizing itself, no matter how well it, uh, it tries. Uh, things often don't work out as much as well as you'd hope. But in science, as a rule, things work out much better than you hope, some of the time. Now, a lot of things don't work, but the important thing is that enough things work to, to make the enterprise really a great enterprise. Um, and also there's a theme which, which runs through all of these. Uh, if you look at it, it's the theme of increasing control. Now, this is not an organizing principle for carrying forward science. This is not one of these uh, great principles that a philosopher of science could, could lay out and say this is what drives science forward, but looking back, it's quite clear this has been what's happening. And that is a very important theme for the work which is being discussed at this conference. For instance, the molecular beam method, you know, this is where you take a beam and you pass it through an inhomogeneous field and uh, the beam gets split. Um, it, it, it was scientifically very important. It, 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 he, uh, he used this to, uh, it was important in the development of quantum mechanics. And the molecular beam methods themselves had an immediate consequence that uh, it was known th that the magnetic moment of the electron was pretty well given by the Bohr magneton, uh, but Stern set out to measure the magnetic moment of the proton by deflecting a beam of molecules through these magnets. Now, nuclear magnetic moments are much smaller than electron magnetic moments, you know, racially, r basically by the ratio of the electron to proton mass. So they're very hard to do. Um, and while he was working on it, uh, and this was told to me by Robbie, because Robbie was working with Stern at the time, that uh, Pauli visited the laboratory and uh, explained, you know, asked what was going on. Uh, Stern explained it to him uh, that he was trying to measure the magnetic moment of the proton, and uh, Pauli said, uh, don't bother, it's not worth the effort. It's very well known, it's given by the nuclear magneton, uh, just the Bohr magneton multiplied by, or divided by 1836. Well, it turned out that the magnetic moment of the proton is larger than that by about a factor of 2.6. It's not at all given by the uh, nuclear magneton. And the reason for that, of course, is that the uh, electron obeys the Dirac theory, but the proton, it does not obey the Dirac theory. It's a hadron, we now have a much better picture of it. 
Um, but I, I just mention that again as an example of a, a very smart physicist uh, whose advice was simply wrong, and a good scientist who had the wisdom to ignore the excellent advice of this leading theorist. Okay, now, the long-term consequences, this is the first time you could study atoms essentially in isolation. They're moving through a vacuum. They're not rattling around in, in a gas discharge or something like that. This was a vital thing in, in the creation of molecular and magnetic resonance. From the point of view of control, we now have a what method for taking a beam of atoms, a stream of atoms, and sorting them into their nuclear spin states or to their magnetic moment states. Uh, this is an electron magnetic moment. But you are now putting atoms, or at least sorting them, in, in their quantum state. It's a level of co control one didn't have before. Robbie the molecular beam magnetic resonance, well, when he invented this technique, it immediately had a, uh, it led to a great discovery, the quadrupole moment of the deuteron. He showed that the deuteron not only had an, uh, a magnetic dipole moment, but an electric quadrupole moment. In, in other words, it meant that the deuteron was not round. And uh, this was the first demonstration of non-central nuclear forces. It led to the hyper measurement on the hyperfine separation of hydrogen. And this was the first indication to, uh, of the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron. And it led to the creation of atomic clocks. What are the long-term consequences? Well, it created a whole new form of spectroscopy, radio frequency spectroscopy. It opened the way to generations of new resonance methods, nuclear magnetic resonance, electric resonance, masers, lasers. From the point of view of control, this type of resonance allows you to move a population of atoms coherently between different states that one can, uh, one can prepare different types of atomic states. You can, uh, you can get coherent superposition, superpositions of states if you wish. So it's a major advance in the, the development of control. Uh, and here, this is from Robbie's original paper. You use two stern gerlach magnets. Uh, th this one deflects atoms in one spin state, and this one over here deflects them back. And in between, if you change the spin state, you, you no longer arrive at the detector. You go, you leave the apparatus. And this is a, a typical example of ha executing this, where we're looking at the population in one spin state, and as we let the atoms make transitions back and forth, they oscillate between these two spin states in this region. What we're looking at is how long we're applying the radio frequency field, which causes the transitions. These Rabi oscillations are now kind of ubiquitous in many scenarios in physics. Okay. Well, nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, it, it allows you to move around populations of nuclear spins and interactions. The long-term consequences, well, the field was immediately, not immediately, but totally swept up uh, in chemistry and biology. It's a standard tool. Uh, in metrology, you make precise magnetometers. The most spectacular application probably is in medicine, the MRI imaging. What we have is a very powerful medical imaging technique which came out of the study of, uh, of nuclear moments. I might say the incentive for studying nuclear moments was to measure the size of these moments from the point of view of nuclear physics. So here we have an application of atomic physics to nuclear physics which ends up producing a, a incredible technology for medicine, and particularly in neuroscience today is being revolutionized by functional magnetic resonance. It stimulated many other resonance methods. And the control, well, with nuclear magnetic resonance, you can take a population of spins and put them anywhere that you want. You can do, make very elaborate, uh, you can do very elaborate manipulations with them. Uh, th this is one of the techniques which is now being used for quantum information processing. So very far from the dreams of anyone who set out to measure uh, nuclear magnetic moments. Okay. Yeah, and, and this is just an example of functional magnetic resonance uh, showing different areas of the brain being, acti brain being activated. I put this up, and this is not up to date right now, simply because this is really having a revolutionary effect on neuroscience on how the brain operates. And you know, to go to 
uh, if you look at the gap between uh, measuring, uh, doing nuclear physics measurements of nuclear moments to neuroscience, it seems an incredibly large gap, but here we are. Okay. Laser spectroscopy, Shallow got it in 72. Well, this is an example of the measurement of the hyperfine, of the fine structure of hydrogen. The best optical methods, uh, the best optical uh, measurements which were made just before the war. And here is the first uh, laser spectroscopy measurement. One can see that this line over here has a number of components under it. And this particular component over there is the one which says the Dirac theory is incomplete. There were efforts to try to fit this line to pull that out, but they were not very conclusive or successful. Th this measurement over here just shows it beyond a shadow of a doubt. It had already been shown by uh, Lamb, of course, with his uh, methods. But right now, the optical methods are much more accurate for getting the Lamb shift than any optical methods. And the spectroscopy of hydrogen, uh, it's sort of a uh, benchmark for high precision. This is a, uh, a sketch by Ted Hench showing the progress over the years, early years of the 20th century, development of laser spectroscopy. And then at this point, there was a break because of the development of optical frequency metrology. And uh, this is not really up to date. Ted suggested that, uh, that this curve is not going to continue to drop so rapidly, but it's down there about 10 to the minus 16th. And my own guess is that uh, it'll continue down, let's see, 10 to the minus 18th. Uh, it, it, it hits at uh, maybe 2012. Well, I'd say by 10 to the 2020, the year 2020, it'll get there. You know, a measurement of a part in 10 to the 18th is quite extraordinary. When you start making clocks which are that good, your, your basic ideas of time have to be changed. Why is that? Well, according to general relativity, time is warped by, by gravity, by mass. And at that level, the, um, the warping of time by mass is so severe, you can no longer talk about time uh, all by itself. Th that you always have to take into account that there's going to be mass around. And first of all, this really makes, it makes you seriously rethink uh, metrology. How are you going to define the second if the, the, if the second depends on just where you are and just where the mass around you is? Um, but beyond that, it, it shows that we have to rethink our basic ideas of time. Because in the past, we, have, we still have a rather metaphysical idea of time. Time is what's measured with clocks. But when you look at general relativity, time is not what, what is measured by clocks. Uh, time is measured by clocks in certain gravitational potentials. So there's a very interesting sea change which is coming. Nonlinear optics. Well, uh, my favorite example of nonlinear optics is this. Uh, th th this was the first demonstration of nonlinear optics in the early days when uh, one took a laser, this was done by Franken at Michigan, uh, a laser over here, a ruby laser, which is running in the red, and passed it through a crystal and looked over here at the second harmonic, which is at half the wavelength down, which is at this point down there. The famous picture, because if you look at it in the Physical Review letters where it was published in 1961, you look very carefully, you see nothing at all. And the reason was that the trace was so faint that the printer thought it was dust and just eliminated it. Um, now, just to show how things have uh, advanced since then, of course, this green laser over here is actually a red laser over here. Uh, not at that frequency, it's a neodymium YAG, it's about 1.02 microns. You wouldn't be able to see the red yourself with the eye, but it's been frequency doubled, and it's, this thing is running uh, with input frequency, input energies of milliwatts. Uh, so here you're, you're looking at an attenuation of uh, something like uh, more than a factor of a billion, and with modern nonlinear optics, um, one can do this with quite high efficiency, approaching over 50 percent. The anomalous magnetic moment of the electron, well, this is an example showing the uh, an experiment in which you're looking at various numbers of electrons, and you're keeping them around for a long time, and you can do the experiment on one electron very well. Th this is now out of date 
because Jerry Gabriel has advanced into a new generation of this type of experiment and achieved a precision which is even 10 times higher. And he has, uh, he can keep a single electron around for weeks or months indefinitely. He keeps them around so long that he gives them a pet name, which I think is not good quantum mechanics. But I guess you get rather familiar with your particle if it's around that long. Okay. Anyway, single particle physics, complete control of the electron state. This ability to do this, which you can now do with ions also, is very important for modern uh, studies of, um, uh, of quantum manipulation of, uh, of quantum, uh, well, quantum calculation. Okay. The ion traps, well, again, this has had a huge impact on, on modern technologies being used in all sorts of applications. Ramsey, the separate oscillatory field method, well, it's the paradigm for atom, atom interferometry, and it's a key technique for atomic clocks. One did not look at it from the point of view of atom interferometry at the time, but it is interferometry. You are interfering two different paths of an atom from a ground state to, to some other state. And th this type of thinking is now very in, in, in ubiquitous in physics and terribly important. Um, and then the laser cooling, that provides the complete control of an atom state, both internal and external. You can control the momentum states of an atom. And uh, Cornell, well, the generation of the atomic quantum fluids, I don't need to labor right here, but it, it is an, the ultimate control of an atomic system. Well, the, the uh, quantum optics <coughs> underlies contemporary research in quantum entanglement, coherent control, and so on. And Hall and Hench, the creation of the optical frequency comb just present, presents incredible control o over light. You can control the phase of light in a light beam, for instance, if you wish. Uh, you, you, this is something which is just totally unheard of before. So again, we have a new form of control. Now, what we have is the complete control of an atom means control of the internal state, control of the external state, and control of the interactions. And this is what we have today. We haven't talked so much about the interactions. I think Vandelay will. But what we have is a new field of physics. It's the physics of, uh, of atomic quantum fluids, which is the subject for this conference. So what we're talking about today is the inheritance of very brilliant people. And I might say they're brilliant and hardworking graduate students over decades, which have brought us to this new vista in physics. Now, let's talk about the role of atomic quantum fluids, which is what we're talking about here in the world of atomic physics. A portrait of atomic physics is given in a recent study controlling the quantum world. Um, it's published, it, it, it's called AMO in the field, AMO 2010. Uh, and it's published by the National Research C Council. Um, I noticed that I looked it up on the, the National Academy's press. Uh, you can buy the book for about $48, but it, it said there that you can download it for free if you're in a developing country. Uh, well, I don't know whether your country is developing or not. Uh, Vandalay, is, uh, is Brazil technically a developing country? Ah, then you're developing. Okay, you, it's, it's free <laughs> if you want it. It's, it's, it's quite an interesting uh, report on what's going on right now. And um, uh, I won't go through the, all the committee, but it's a very uh, distinguished committee. Uh, what, if you notice Gordon Bame, who is a leading um, many body theorist, background in nuclear physics, he's now on this committee uh, because uh, it was felt that his perspective is essential for assessing where things are and where they're going. And furthermore, he felt that it was important enough to spend his time uh, on the committee. Um, and I'd just like to briefly summarize where we are today in atomic physics. Okay. First topic, science and the basic laws of nature. 
fundamental tests have always been a driving force in atomic physics, and they continue to be, and they're very closely allied with very interesting developments in technology, in metrology, in atomic clocks. Uh, and of course, the real success story for atomic physics, if you want to trot out, well, you should trot out the laser, but lots of people take, uh, take uh, credit for the laser. But these atomic clocks led to the global positioning system. But this question, is alpha constant or is it changing in time? There are applications to detection of gravitational waves. That's been a very long-term vision, but it's moving forward at, uh, at, at seemingly quite a healthy pace. Uh, it develops the magnetometry and medical imaging and matter wave interferometry. This is just some of the uh, new techniques which are being used to basic uh, tests. Second thing is the subject of this conference towards absolute zero, condensed matter physics and dilute atomic systems. That's what this conference is all about, and that was sort of headlined in this report. Uh, you can tune the interactions between atoms, optical lattices, optics. These are some of the things that we'll be hearing about, and then applications into other areas of physics. Uh, another very interesting area is extreme light, namely table source X-ray lasers, uh, high-intensity X-rays, X-ray nonlinear optics, ultra-intense lasers, one application is accelerating particles with light. And now lasers uh, have moved. Well, when I was just starting my career, people were starting to think about doing nanosecond physics, which seemed to me incredible. And uh, then uh, in, before too long, they were talking about picosecond physics, you know, 10 to the minus 12 seconds, which seemed to me just unbelievable. And then they started talking about femtosecond physics, which seem to me even more unbelievable, but now they're in the attosecond regime, and it just shows that, uh, that physics can move faster than one's imagination, at least this one's imagination. Okay. Uh, an old dream, quantum control of molecules, uh, has not moved forward over the years, but now there's a feeling that you can because of the great control that one has over light with these new methods for controlling the phase is at frequencies of light. And one of the applications there is this attosecond science. <laughs> Photonics on the na nano world, well, these are just te atomic techniques which are useful in this world and, uh, and are very appealing, particularly to politicians, since nano science is very, very fashionable. <laughs> uh, and then this quantum information with light and atoms. This is another area which has uh, sort of grown more than people might have guessed. Uh, it's engaging some of the, the, the most, uh, some of the best theorists right now have moved into this field. It, it's endlessly fascinating, and there are lots of experiments going on. So far, the advances in theory have been outra <coughs> outracing <coughs> the advances in experiments, but there's a <coughs> lot of interest in this, including in, this, in the CUA right now. So um, this is another area in which one can expect important advances. <coughs> All right. Now, I'd just like to conclude this with, with um, three comments on this, on the predictions of decadal surveys of physics, such as AMO 2010. These uh, decadal surveys, about every 10 years, the uh, National Research Council does a survey of the field. And I've, I'm sort of a connoisseur since I've watched them for a long time. I participated in the 1972 survey, and at that time I'd look back to the first one, which was in 1966, the Paik survey. The 72 was actually chaired by, uh, by Bloomberg. And, and in, in uh, 1984, there was the next survey came out. Uh, I actually chaired the, uh, the atomic physics report in that. And then uh, one came out in 1994, and now we have one just now. It's very interesting reading, looking back on these surveys. I know the work which goes into them, people really think very hard, and there's a lot of uh, discussion back and forth, and you put your best foot forward. In every case, they missed the boat. In 1972, laser spectro lasers had been invented, and laser spectroscopy was starting. The survey said hardly anything about laser spectroscopy. just wasn't quite there yet. But within two or three years, spectroscopy had been revolutionized. Um, in 19... Uh, 84, let's see, the boat we missed there, well, the, the survey doesn't say anything about chaos on nonlinear dynamics, which immediately became terribly important. Uh, it it uh, sort of opened a new area of 
It became serious physics, there were serious studies of quantum chaos, not a measurement, uh, nothing like that. Uh, but more seriously, there was no discussion of laser cooling. Well, the first experiments were just going on around then. You know, they were a little bit crude, uh, but a lot of good people were really interested in it, and we didn't pay any attention to it at all. So we'd missed laser cooling completely. So in 1994, the, uh, the survey was glowing with its endorsements of laser cooling and uh, what you could do with laser cooling, but there's virtually no measure mention of Bose-Einstein condensation. Right? Bose-Einstein condensation was discovered the following year. Well, the, the field had been moving so rapidly. Bose-Einstein condensation had been such a distant dream that, uh, th that no one took it very seriously. So here is, again, a survey which missed the biggest accomplishment to come. So it, it was for that reason, really, the, a, a report was uh, uh, we have now this report going on. Bose-Einstein condensation is here, and its uh, implications are quite well known. But just looking at the, at the past history of these reports, uh, which always seem to miss the major boat, okay, uh, makes me think there's a good reason that what's going to happen in the next two years is beyond anything which is speculated on in this report. Um, th that's a very nice situation to be in. It means that one can be very optimistic about the field, which is good, particularly if you're, if you're very young and starting out, uh, that this field right now is it's, it's hopping with what's going on right now. But it's, it's hopping in a way which I have never seen before. The excitement that we have in the field right now is at a higher level than, than any I have known before. So on the general state of AMO physics today, I've never known it to be in this, such an exciting situation. But on the role of atomic quantum fluids, has, this has made a sea change in the field. And this conference, I think, I is one indication of that sea change. It's the merging of atomic physics with condensed matter theory, where it's believed that problems in condensed matter physics, which have been uh, intractable and enigmatic, uh, most famously the problem of high temperature superconductivity, may yield to studies with these new techniques which have come available, but also the feeling that we have such a rich array of new systems to study that had not been considered before and which can be studied experimentally like atomic physicists do. And the standards in atomic physics are very high. You want complete control. You'd like to know everything about the system. You want to be able to control everything. This is unique to the field of atomic physics, but now this can be brought to bear on many body systems, which are the province of condensed matter physics. And so uh, the, the field is just poised to jump forwards. And so I think Vandalay and I and the other lecturers here all hope that, uh, that this school will give some help and encouragement to young people who uh, are the people who are going to make it jump forwards. Well, look, I think at this point I'll conclude this lengthy introduction and let's have a three minute or five minute uh, break so you don't um, you can stretch or inhale or uh, relax for just a couple of minutes. Uh, but I w let me just toss out an idea for anyone here uh, who'd like to pick up on it. Um, for conferences, for getting people back like this, it's always a problem. If you've ever seen sheep dogs at work, they're marvelous at rounding up sheep. They can round up people, too. And you can make a good business of having sheep dogs which go to conferences and get people back in from the coffee breaks. They would bark at them and they would tug at them and get them back in very quickly. Anyway, okay. Um, okay, we're going to... Uh, switch now from sort of the, uh, these Olympian comments about, uh, about atomic physics to the, the, uh, their nuts and bolts. Um, I have chosen a series of subjects which I think are very useful for anyone who wants to think about uh, doing experiments or proposing experiments for, uh, for uh, ultra-cold atoms. One needs to know uh, about uh, about how you can use these atoms. What are the limitations on them? Uh, what are the considerations which come in? 
what are the techniques that you use. Um, and so th the subjects, th I can't certainly do all of atomic physics, or all even basic atomic physics, um, but um, I will be handing out notes which will supplement these, which may be useful. But what I want to do is talk about some of the sort of basic processes which take place. Uh, th th these processes are well known. They've been studied for many years. There are many ways to describe them in many cases. Um, but I'd like to start with uh, the description of a very basic system which gives a way of looking at many general processes. And th the, th the basic process that I want to talk about to begin with is, is the process of magnetic resonance. Is this visible? It looks kind of... I can't tell. Is, is, is that visible to you? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I would like to, uh, to talk about something which is called, well, it's the motion of spins in a B field. I want to talk about uh, what's called Robbie resonance. Um, I'm going to talk about a subject called uh, the Landau Zener effect and, um, and adiabatic transitions. And I would like to tie this with a very elegant way of looking at all these things, which is called the dressed atom picture. So, so those are the topics. Um, now, this is all going to be applied basically to atoms. Some of them apply to molecules, too. And uh, I don't want to go down a, well, I will. I'll talk about the, you know, the properties of atoms that are important to us. They're, 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 of course, there's the mass of the atom. Well, masses, there's the electron mass. And I'm not, I won't put in the numerical values because they'll be in the notes. And we'll pull them out where we need to. Uh, there's the mass of the proton. Um, uh, there's the mass of the neutron. which is essentially the mass of the proton. And then there's the, uh, the nuclear mass. Which is A times the mass of the proton, where A, the mass number, is equal to the um, N plus Z. Th this is the atomic number, and this is the neutron number. So they have mass. They also the particles carry charge. The electron is uh, minus E for the electron. The proton is plus E. And of course, the neutron is 0. And the nucleus is equal to Z times E. Very importantly, they carry angular momentum. The electron, the angular momentum, is s equal to one half, and I'm using angular momentum is equal to h bar s. Without saying, I'm always going to be measuring angular momentum in units of h bar. Okay. Um, the proton i is equal to one half. Um, the neutron. I is equal to um, to one half, and nuclei. Well, the, the um, it's even a. 
than, than the nuclear magnetic moment, it, it's going to be equal to 0, 1, 2, and odd A is going to equal 1 half, 3 halves, and so on. Okay. And then does this move up? Mm, this must have a motor on it. Does anyone? There must be a magic button. No, it looks like. No. How about maybe this looks like a button? Oh, that's, that's the light. Let's try. We will find the manual. <laughs> well, it, you think it pushes up. Maybe it takes. Oh, you're right. It does go. Yeah. Clearly designed for young, vigorous lecturers. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Statistics, which of course are very important for everything here, as we know, um, the the electrons of a Fermi Dirac and uh, and the nuclei odd obey Fermi Dirac and even obey Bose uh, obey Bose uh, statistics Bose Einstein statistics. And then, very important, are the magnetic moments. Okay. <coughs> electron, the magnetic moment of the electron, which I'll write like that, can be written as gamma E times h bar s. Gamma E, of course, is the it's called the gyro magnetic moment, a gyro magnetic ratio, which is a misnomer. It's actually the uh, magnetogyric ratio, because you multiply this ratio by the angular momentum, and you get the magnetic moment. Um, this can also be written as minus g, the electron magnetic moment, times mu b times s. In fact, we can write it like that, where mu b, this of course is the Bohr magneton which is uh, E h bar over 2m in SI units. I'll try to stick to SI units wherever we use units, but I may run afoul because that's not the way I was born up. They seem to be very artificial, um, but we're stuck with them, so <laughs> we'll try to use them. Um, and for the proton, that can be written as gyromagnetic ratio of the proton times, uh, times h bar times i. Um, and we can write this as the g factor for the nucleus times um, un times i. Yeah. The g factor for the electron is um, 2 by the Dirac theory 
differs by about a part in a thousand from the Dirac theory, and this is the thing which has been measured uh, so accurately. We put a minus sign in here because the G factor by convention is taken as positive, but the uh, magne <coughs> magnetic moment of the electron is negative, namely, you know, if it's spinning in this direction, the magnetic moment is in that direction because the electron charge is negative, um, simply because Benjamin Franklin made the wrong choice when he assigned signs to electric charges, but he had no way of knowing. Okay, so the, um, so the proton, is not two. It's about 5.6. Yeah. Um, for the neutron, the G factor is equal to minus 3.7. Yeah. These gyromagnetic ratios have the units of, um, of frequency and well, frequency per field. Namely, if you multiply this by a field, you have an energy. If you take the energy and divide it by h bar, you have a frequency, and that's why the gyromagnetic ratios have a frequency. And for the electron, gamma e is equal to 2 pi times 2.8 times 10 to the fourth um, megahertz per Tesla, or we can also write this 2.2 2 pi times 2.8, it is, yeah, 2.8 times 10 to the sixth um, hertz per Gauss. And for the proton, this is a famous number used MRI people, um, the gyromagnetic ratio of the proton comes out to be 2, point, 2 pi times 42.6 megahertz per Tesla, or 2 pi times 40. 2.6 um, times, let's see, it's going to be kilohertz, no, 4.26, 4.26 kilohertz per, per Gauss. Okay. So that's the arsenal of the particles that we're going to be talking about. And what I want to do is to talk about what happens when you put these magnetic moments in a uh, magnetic field. Of course, <coughs> a field can do two things to magnetic moments. It can exert a force, and it can exert a torque. Well, let's talk about uniform fields right now. In a uniform field, there is no force on a magnetic moment, right? but there is a torque on it. And what we want to do is to look at the effects of this. Now, what I'm going to do is to look at this classically. The reason that it's worthwhile looking at it classically is we can easily show that the quantum mechanical behavior is exactly the same as the classical, namely <coughs> the quantum mechanical um, expectation values for the operators for, the, for its motion obey the classical equations of motion. This is not a satisfactory way to get a complete description of a system, but it gives you a lot of insight into the motions of particles in fields and it carries over to large areas, surprising areas of atomic physics. So the simple motion, say, of a proton in the magnetic field will tell us a lot about the behavior of um, atoms um, uh, under the uh, I interacting, say, with radiation fields, uh, with time-varying fields of, vari of various amounts. And it will show us, uh, it'll be very useful in visualizing how uh, manipulations of these atoms can take place. So uh, with these reasons for motivating it, and probably because this is the way I learned it in the first place, and although we have modern ways, more sophisticated ways to describe these systems, which I will <coughs> try to indicate, I think it still gives a lot of uh, 
insight and is worth the effort. As you may recall from freshman mechanics, if you apply a torque to a system, its angular momentum changes. Well, we have systems with a lot of angular momentum in them. What makes it very nice is that these are quantum systems. Turns out angular momentum behaves much, much easier to understand in quantum systems than in classical systems. So a, a magnetic moment in field in a uniform field. Uniform magnetic field, which I will call B. There's going to be a torque. The torque is equal to the magnetic moment crossed into the field. And that's going to be the rate of change of angular momentum. This is going to be d by dt of the angular momentum. L let me just, let's talk about a proton. I'll just call it, well, h bar, it doesn't need to be a proton. It's any system with a spin i, okay? Now, mu is going to be proportional to the angular momentum, gamma times h bar times i. This, this proportionality is terribly, uh, is, is quite fundamental. The magnetic moment has to point along the angular momentum. Now, if you calculate classical angular momentum of spinning particles, you'll see that this is true. But it's true for a more profound reason, <coughs> reason, namely that this is the only vector that one has associated with a particle, say a proton, yeah. a proton at rest. If this is the only vector which is associated with it, and if we want to associate another vector with it, th they have to be proportional to each other. Namely, what way could, could this point if not along here. So we have this correspondence between the direction of the magnetic moment and the direction of the angular momentum. So our equation over here, d by dt of h bar i can be written as gamma times, times h bar times i cross b. Or the i by dt is equal to minus b cross, minus gamma b cross i. Okay. Well, this is a famous equation. It's the rate of change of this angular momentum is something crossed into the angular momentum. The only thing it can do is to precess, right? It means because this rate of change is always perpendicular to it, the thing just can go round and round. So if we have the, say, the B field like that, and say I is pointing like that, um, B cross I, of course, is going to be pointing into the board, and minus B cross I is going to be pointing out of the board, it means that this is just going to go be going around in a circle like that. And this, of course, is called precession. And the rate of precession, I'm going to call omega, which is equal to minus gamma B. Well, the minus sign just says that it's going to be precessing this way if B is pointing that way. And this is called the Larmor frequency. So what we have is this thing going around like that. 
not a very interesting motion. It just, it just precesses around and around. <laughs> Suppose we'd like to change that motion. And this is the basic uh, insight that, that Robbie had when he invented magnetic molecular beam magnetic resonance. Suppose th that I have a magnetic field over here. I'll, I'll write this thing as B1, which is a rotating field. And let's, for the moment, let's just say rotate at rate at, at minus omega Larmor. In other words, it's got to be going around just like this. Okay. Well, if this is going around at the same rate that that's going around, this moment now sees not only that field over there, it sees this field over here. And it's going to tend to precess around both of them. And Robbie argued, well, if this is going around at exactly the rate that that's going around, um, l let's just go around ourselves and look at it. In this rotating system, as we go around, what we see is a static field in this direction. We have the magnetic moment in that direction, and it's just going to precess around this field like this. So in our space, it executes a very simple motion. And back in the laboratory, well, it'll be some more complicated motion, but it's going to be reorienting itself. And that is the uh, basic idea of magnetic resonance. Now, a this is a very simple model of motion in a rotating field can be, uh, can be made <coughs> very useful. You can actually calculate the motion there. <coughs> and I think it's uh, a useful, well, it is a useful thing to do, kind of doing it formally. So let's look at the motion in a rotating coordinate system. And in a rotating coordinate system for any vector, we have the rate of change of that vector. I'll call it dA by dt in one system, which I will call my inertial system, is going to equal dA by dt as observed in the rotating system plus omega cross a. And th this is the th this is the uh, rotation, the, the rotating. Uh, it, it's the rotation frequency. Namely, you're going around at omega, and you're doing it at uh, uh, along some axis. Okay, um, th that's well known. If you have trouble remembering it, just think. <laughs> um, first of all, if um, if you're in the rotating system and A is going around at omega, then it will, if you're in, let's say, if you're in the, if you're in the rotating system, but A is constant in the rotating system, then, then um, let's see, blah, 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 what do I want to say? If it, looks, if it looks static, if this is zero, if it's at rest in the rotating system, in the laboratory system, it's just going to be going around at omega cross A. If it's at rest in the inertial system, then in the rotating system, if this is zero, it's going to look like it's going in the opposite direction. Since my system's going this way, the thing is standing still, so it looks like it's going in the opposite direction. Anyway, it's just a general vector transformation. So let's apply it over here dA by dt in the rotating system is going to equal dA by dt in the inertial system minus omega cross A. Okay. Now, at this point, I see it is 1032. And if I continue, I think I will be transgressing on your coffee break. So I'll finish this up very quickly the next time. So <clears throat> why don't we stop at this point? Is this the point to stop? Yeah. Yeah.
Are there any questions? Good. No, well, um, that's good. This is, uh, let me just ask one question. How many of you have, have seen all this before? Well, roughly half. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you just mentioned about the possibility of uh, uh, mixing high precision with quantum field. Well, um, certainly high precision with ultra cold atoms is a, is a natural. In quantum fluids, one always has to start thinking about the interactions between these atoms. Quantum fluids, in a sense, are, are dense because they're quantum degenerate. They're interacting with each other. Interactions are bad for high precision. So that's one obstacle that one immediately has to think about. And I must say, I haven't thought about it. Yeah, well now, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think this is a very good point. It, it, it shows different fields use different languages. In atomic physics, when one talks about high precision, we're talking about, you know, part in 10 to the 12th or, or beyond. Um, you know, in that region, that's what high precision is. In, in many body physics, well, uh, you know, making predictions to 1% is, is often considered uh, fabulous. So I think for, for the study of many body systems, for problems in condensed matter theory, these are ideal for high precision. You can make careful measurements with full control. From the point of view of, of metrology, though, uh, that's another matter. Okay, <laughs> I'd like to um, continue with this varied ex exhibition or exposition into the fundamentals of, um, of manipulating atoms with light, with coherent light. I'm not talking about laser cooling now, but I am talking about controlling populations, moving atoms around in, in their internal states. Um, and it's ap bordering applications. This is, of course, very close to issues of uh, laser spectroscopy. What I want to do, though, is to continue talking about this uh, primal system, the two-level system. Um, and uh, I'm discussing that in the contents of magnetic, magnetic resonance, particularly for a spin one-half system. And um, I will be talking about, well, I'm uh, already talking about the r rotating coordinate transformation. I would like to, uh, I'm going to use that to talk about what we call Rabi resonance. Um, I would like to talk then about the ideas of adiabatic transitions. A very appealing idea where you, you go from one state into another state without knowing that anything has changed. Um, and then I will talk a little bit about the, the landau zener effect. And use this to sort of motivate a, a, um, a foray into the dressed atom picture. And if time permits, then um, I better watch the time. We started late, we'll end late. 
um, we'll talk about the, I'd like to talk about the Einstein radiation theory. So that's the menu. Um, let me just pick up where we left off before. I talked about uh, how vectors look in a rotating coordinate system. And what I want to do is to apply it to, to spins in a magnetic field. So pointed out in general, the rotating coordinate transformation is that dA by dt inertial is the derivative observed in the rotating system plus omega cross A, where omega is any rotation axis that you want. It's a uniform um, rotation. Okay. So I just want to reverse this now, and I will observe that the rotating system is equal to dA by dt in the inertial system minus omega cross A. And so now let's, let's apply this to the, um, to the motion of a, um, of a magnetic moment. For instance, if, if we're going to let A over here is, is going to go to, the, uh, uh, to a magnetic moment mu, which is equal to gamma times I. So it's really a, uh, a angular momentum that we're looking at. And this says that di by dt in the rotating system is going to be equal to gamma i cross b. Minus omega cross i. And we can write this as gamma i cross b effective, where b effective is equal to um, b plus omega over gamma. And if we choose omega is equal to minus gamma b, then uh, b effective is equal to 0. Well, this seems like um, cracking a peanut with a sledgehammer. What I've shown is that uh, a, a magnetic moment precesses uniformly in a uh, magnetic field. If you go into a system which is precessing uniformly with the magnetic moment, it looks like it's standing still. Uh, and indeed, it does have that consequence. But um, we can take it beyond that. Suppose that we have a static field in the laboratory, B naught which I'm taking along the z-axis. And suppose we have a rotating field over here, B1. And this is the rotating field at some rate over here, which is omega around the z-axis. Okay. Then the effective field, B effective, <laughs> is equal to B naught uh, minus omega over gamma. Okay. I'm taking omega along the z-axis. So this is omega over gamma over here. And B effective is like that. If Omega is equal to 
omega naught, which is equal to gamma b naught, then in that, in that case, uh, b effective is just going to equal b1. So now we have the picture of a moment over here. And I'll start with a moment pointing along one of these axes. We can come back to that. But let's assume that at t equals 0, the moment is pointing like that. Or if you like, i is pointing like that. And then it's going to be precessing around this, this field. Now, if we're at resonance, so that omega over gamma looks like that, we have B1 like that, and then the picture simply is B1 over here. The moment's like that, and it precesses around here at the rate omega uh, times um, B1. And uh, I already drew a picture of that. What happens is that as a function of time, the z component of, of i or of the magnetic moment, let's take the magnetic moment, if it's like that there, in time, it's just going to oscillate up and down like that. This is the function of time. And the rate is equal to gamma b1. <coughs> now, this is a um, maybe the most primitive case of, of resonance. We're stimulating a transition between two states with a, uh, an oscillatory field, which is exactly at the correct frequency. Of course, I haven't done this quantum mechanically, but I did indicate that, uh, or maybe I haven't, but anyway, quantum mechanically, it does behave just like this. Now, suppose that uh, we're off resonance like this. Here, omega is, say, less than omega naught. Then the effective field looks like that. And the picture that we have instead of being like that, we have our effective field like that. Our moment is initially in this direction like that. It recesses around this field over here. So it goes around a plane which kind of looks like that. In other words, you know, as time goes on, it's pointing there, there, there. It sort of sweeps out a cone in space like that. Well, one thing you can see is that it's never going to go down here. It doesn't, it, it never flips over. You never succeed, <coughs> succeed in inverting the um, population there or the inverting the spin, which isn't too surprising. You're off resonance. You're not at the right resonance frequency. But it is possible to calculate what uz of t is. And I won't go through it right here. It's just a little geometric calculation, which you might amuse yourself by doing. Um, but it will be in the notes. Um, what one can show is that the, a, as a function of time, it's just going to be mu times 1 minus twice the Rabi frequency squared over the Rabi frequency squared plus omega minus omega naught squared times the sine squared of one half omega Rabi squared plus omega minus omega naught squared t. Well, I'm using little omegas rather than large omegas here. That's just a matter of convention. <coughs> omega naught is equal to gamma times b naught. And that's the Larmor frequency. <coughs> The one thing that you notice is if you're not on resonance over here, um, th this thing is always going to be less than 1. This is going to be less than 2. If you're on resonance, of course, this is 1 over here. And that's just omega Ramsey t. It's just oscillating back and forth. 
Um, if you're off resonance over here, the oscillation frequency is faster, but it never flips all the way over. So, and that's what the motion that we have here. It's actually precessing around here faster than it would precess around on resonance. And the reason for that is that the magnitude of the effective field is larger than the magnitude of this rotating field over here, B1. So it goes faster, but it never gets down here. It never, never really inverts. So that's the classical motion in the field. Now, in fact, the quantum mechanical motion is identical. And that's why it's worth uh, trotting out this kind of um, classical picture of it, because it does give you a, a valid representation of what's going on in the system. What it doesn't do for you, of course, is solve the quantum mechanical problem. The qu quantum mechanical problem is that we really have a spin one half, two state system over here. We'd like to know the amplitudes for each of the two components of that two state system. And the that's, <coughs> that's easily found also. But this gives us something which is more valuable practically. Namely, we'd like to know transition probabilities in the system. We'd like to know dynamically how the system changes. <coughs> and for that, the classical picture is really excellent. OK, so now let me just prove to you that this is on the up and up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I did change the notation over here. Um, I'm sorry, I let capital omega over here go to small omega. Why did I do that? Because I often see it this way. I do it to confuse the audience. I'm sorry, I should stick to one notation, but I hope this isn't uh, a serious problem. OK. Now, when I talk about the angular momentum over here or the magnetic moment, and what it's doing. What I'm really, of course, looking at is the expectation value of quantum mechanical operators. Because in quantum mechanics, <coughs> these variables are operators. And we like to see how they behave in time. And a fundamental consequence of, mechanical, of quantum mechanics is that the rate of change of the expectation value I guess I'm getting stronger in time. <laughs> this is any operator over here. It's given by I, I over h bar times the commutator, h. It's the expectation value of this commutator over here plus the expectation value if the operator is time dependent, like that. Well, I'm dealing with uh, magnetic moments with spins. These are not time dependent, so we can forget that over here. Okay. So what we have is that the rate of change of, say, the angular momentum over here, i, is equal to i over h bar times the expectation value of the commutator of, of h with i. Now, what is the Hamiltonian for the system over here? The Hamiltonian is just the system interacting with the field. Um, it is equal to minus gamma b uh, minus gamma b naught times i. b naught dot i, which is minus gamma times b naught times i z. So what this becomes then is equal to minus gamma b naught over h bar times the expectation value of i z with i.
Now, the commutators for angular momentum, you know, they obey the rule for general any angular momentum. J cross J is equal to I h bar times J. I mean, this means that Jx, Jy minus Jy, Jx is equal to I h bar times Jz, etc. So the first thing that we see over here is that d by dt, the expectation value of Iz is going to equal 0. That's because uh, you know, Iz, Iz uh, you know, commutes with I, so that, that is 0. What does that tell us? Well, no matter what the angular momentum is doing in time, the z component is staying constant. Well, that's just what you expect. If you're precessing around a field in the z direction, the z component is, is constant. Now, d by dt of the expectation value of ix is going to be equal to minus gamma b naught over h bar. Ix iy um, is going to be equal to that commutator is going to be equal to i h bar times j z. No, I'm sorry. It's going to be i h bar. The commutator of of i x with i z is going to be j x j y. Let's see. I x with x z is going to equal minus i h bar times j y. going to be equal to minus gamma b naught over h bar. And then I want the commutator of <coughs> iz times ix, and that's going to be i h bar i y. So it's going to be equal to minus gamma i. It's minus gamma b naught i times i sub y. And similarly, d by dt of i sub y is going to come out to be equal to plus gamma times b naught. Do the i should go out also? Da, 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 da. Yeah, there's an i over h bar out front. So there's another i over here which I have left out. So that makes it plus. And this is going to be equal to minus gamma b naught times i x. Yeah. Oh. OK, it says that you know, as time goes on, i x dot is going, this is a rotating vector. Right? d by dt of i x is in the i y direction, d by d of i z is in the i x direction. It's a rotating vector. It is just the same as a classical motion. In fact, I can summarize this by saying <coughs> that d i by d t is going to equal minus gamma um, j gamma times i cross b. Huh. And that is the same as the, uh, I should take the expectation values over here. And uh, this is just the classical equation. Okay. So for these magnetic moments and fields, the quantum mechanical and the classical descriptions are the same. <coughs> And that's why this, um, this mechanical picture, the rotating coordinate picture, is so useful. Now, yes, yeah. 
targeting more people this way mm -hmm. than a direct one. Yeah. So you can, if you need some men, you have a continuous value between mining new people to. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're talking about, uh, say, an ensemble of particles together, which, w which for instance, have a nuclear magnetic resonance, where you have sort of a macroscopic magnetization, which is made up of all of these particles, you will, you will find that in time you can actually track the, the directions of the magnetization. I'm, I'm not measuring the, uh, the uh, I'm looking at the expectation value of an ensemble average here. Yeah. But you're quite right. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the uh, quantum mechanical interpretation of a measurement is totally different from a classical interpretation. Yeah, because the solution of this equation will, will give you something like that, plus so on. Yeah. But quantum mechanics, I, I suppose that time square accounts for, for probability now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. True? Yep. And um, <coughs> what it means is, uh, yeah. If you solve this equation that you yeah. you derive from Heisenberg equation, yeah. okay, yeah. I, you have the same form of the classical one. Mm -hmm. So, form of solution have, I think that's the same. Yeah. I think the big difference though is in this idea of the expectation value of the operator. The idea of the expectation value of the operator implies in it many measurements. It implies that measuring a probability. So the probabilities obey the classical behavior. But on any, any individual measurement, uh, you're obviously going to get just one of the eigenvalues for the system. Yeah, so it's a good point. Now, what I'd like to do is to add a twist to this over here, because what I've talked about is a very simple situation where I start somehow with spins pointing in this direction. I apply a rotating field in this direction. I know what these spins are going to do. They're going to be precessing around in time, and I can calculate the probability that they'll be, say, up or down, or what the components will be. Um, let me. take this picture over here again, and here is my B naught. And suppose I'm very far from resonance, so I have this little field, uh, omega over gamma, where now omega is much less than the resonance frequency omega naught. Okay. Suppose I start with the spins pointing up, or to be a little bit more precise, almost pointing up. But of course, they won't be exactly along the z-axis. But suppose that they are generally in this direction. So the spins are lying in a little cone like that. And the average value of this spin here, this is mu z at t equals 0. Okay. And uh, this is really with b1 over here very, very small. Okay. Now suppose I turn this thing on. Well, if this is very small, and I'm far from resonance, let's say that this is small, I'm almost parallel like that. And the spins, which may have been precessing around like that, are essentially going to be precessing around this little vector over here. Okay. Here is omega over gamma. Okay. Now suppose that I start sweeping the frequency towards resonance frequency. Well, you can see what's going to happen. This is B1. And initially, my effective field is pointing like that. As time goes on, it points like that, and like that, and like that. Suppose I keep going far to the other side of resonance. It goes down like that, and eventually like that, and eventually like that. 
Now, if I do this very slowly, the spins, which they are in this little cone circulating around here, they're circulating around here at this frequency omega, which is equal to gamma times the effective field. They're circulating around that. If I do that very slowly, they're just going to continue to circulate around there. When I get down here, they're going to be in a little cone, you know, again, along this direction. And when I'm all through, they'll be circulating down or, you know, around a little cone, which is pointing down here. Okay. So if I sweep slowly the frequency, this total population, which was pointing up, is now pointing down. Well, one question is, why do I want to do this? Well, I've talked about a rather idealized system in which uh, every spin is seeing exactly the same magnetic field. If they're seeing exactly the same magnetic field and I just sit on resonance, then the spins which are pointing up there are just going to precess down here. I turn off the oscillating field and I flip this system over. So that's an ideal situation, but very often that isn't what occurs, that there's broadening to the line. They don't all see the same field. And in that case, uh, they won't all point down. They'll be pointing in somewhat different directions. You can't invert the population very well that way. Furthermore, you, gotta hit the, you have to hit the resonance on the head. You have to know exactly what the right frequency is. And you've got to leave it on for exactly the right amount of time. The time to go from there down to there. And then you turn it off. <coughs> um, so that all takes a lot of control. Here, you don't really need to be nearly as careful. You just start sweeping some field which is very far below resonance. You keep sweeping until you're far above resonance, and then you turn it off. If, uh, if particles see different fields, they go through here at kind of at, at different rates, but they all end up doing the same thing. So th this is called, in, in the parlance of nuclear magnetic resonance, adiabatic rapid passage. It's adiabatic in that we're changing the state of the atom from pointing up there to pointing down here but we're doing it in a continuous fashion. We're just altering the state, so it goes from one to the other. And in nuclear magnetic resonance, they call it rapid passage, because if you take too long, you, you lose, because there are relaxation mechanisms which we've not talked about here. So you have to do it faster than you lose the coherence in the system. Um, so it's a, it, it's a very handy, and, it, and it's a rather general technique. But there is another way of looking at this technique, which is really uh, kind of enlightening, which I like. I want to connect this with an effect in quantum mechanics called the Landau-Zener effect. This was discovered independently by Landau and Zener sometime, I think, in the late 20s or early 30s, early on in uh, questions of molecular collisions, where you have two, say, atoms approaching each other. One might have a potential which looks like that, and another one what might come in on a potential which looks, won't look like that. It might look like, say, this. And the particles, maybe they come in like this and make a collision. And it turns out they can come in like this and go out like that. And the way they go out is because these levels over here cross. And there's a coupling between them. And if there's a coupling between them, the levels kind of do something like this. You know. And if they do something like that, so the adiabatic levels over here really shifted. Before there was a coupling, this level was that. Now after there's a coupling, this level over here is that. But if they're coming in fast enough, they will jump from here to here. You know, they won't notice the coupling. So they'll come in along here. And then if they come back out, they'll jump, they can jump back. But they may not. If, if the jump isn't 100%, if it isn't complete, turns out they have some probability of jumping there on the way in and some probability of staying there on the way out. And this is how an inelastic molecular collision takes place. <coughs> so that's sort of the, the granddaddy of all of these things. But a more typical picture is you have two energy levels like this, which vary 
with some parameter over here. There's some parameter. It could be field, it could be something else, but it is varying in time. Okay. Now, the question is, suppose a particle starts over here at t equals zero, and you change the parameter, and it goes up here at a much later time, t you know, goes to infinity, you end up over here. But the levels cross. And suppose there's some coupling between the levels. If there's coupling between levels, they're going to anti-cross like that. And if this is a two-level system, and if the off-diagonal off matrix element between them is V, which we will write, but I'll just say it right now, this is a separation over here, which is twice V. So. The question is, <coughs> what is the probability that if you start over here and then move over there in some finite time, that you're going to end up in this level or you're going to end up in that level? Okay. Namely, are you going to go through adiabatically or non-adiabatically? And the result of the analysis over here is the probability of non-adiabatic traversals, i.e. of jumping from here over to he here, is go goes as e to the minus 2 pi times d squared over h bar times dw <coughs> by dt. Now, dW by dt, th this is the separation between them, okay? W, which is varying in time. If you vary very, very slowly over here, if this is small and this is very large, then uh, this probability goes to zero, right? So if you go through slowly, you never jump. On the other hand, if you go through very, very rapidly, if this goes to infinity and maybe this goes slowly, then this thing over here is going to go to one, and you always jump. Are you familiar with this? Have you, many of you come across this before? No. Well, um, let me, if you're interested, because it's a very interesting thing, th there is a paper, um, I'll give you just, there'll be some references in the notes that I will hand out, but J.R. Rubnark et al. I am one of the et al's. Um, P.R. A23 2978 and it is 1981. Now there are other discussions of the landau zener effect. I particularly like that one because it was an experimental paper. We decided to make it a pedagogical paper so it discusses the the quantum mechanical solution to the problem. One can set it up and, and, and where the solution comes from. Although I might say that this factor of 2 pi comes from the solution of a differential equation, which uh, I think Landau and Zener both just said uh, it's well known. And we haven't been able to actually reconstruct that numerical solution to the equation and don't know anyone who does. So if you should find the actual solution to that problem, the numerical solution to it, <coughs> that factor of 2 pi, I would very much like to know about it. Well, let me make a connection between this picture and what we were talking about over here with the rotating um, coordinates. Yeah. 
the Hamiltonian that we're talking about here, h, is equal to minus mu dot v. And I'm going to look at this in the rotating coordinate system. So this is just equal to minus uh, mu z times b z minus mu x times b x. This is what I call b1, b4. And th this is in the rotating system. Okay. So I can write this thing over here as minus gamma h bar times iz times bz minus gamma h bar times ix bx. Now, I want to talk about a spin one half system. Okay. So, so we're limited just to the eigenvalues now. Okay. There are matrix elements of this which couple these two spin states, H. This, the, two, the spin one half system, the two states are, you know, um, one half, I can write it like that, and minus one half, like so. Um, the, the, uh, coupling this, minus one half, and it's equal to minus gamma h bar times bx times one half times jx times minus one half. Now, Jx is going to have matrix elements which couple these two systems over here, because I can write Jx as equal to one half Jx plus i Jy. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm switching to x's into j's over here again. I'm trying to stick to i's, so we'll make it ix. ix plus i times iy, you know, plus one half times ix minus i times iy, <coughs> or it just it's equal to um, oh, this is ix is equal to it's equal to one half i plus plus one half i minus. I assume you're familiar with these, the quantum mechanical raising and lowering operators. So this matrix element over here, one half h times minus one half, is simply going to be equal to um, minus gamma h bar times bx times one half well, I have the matrix element one half i x uh, i plus plus i minus times minus one half. The i minus operating on this gives me nothing at all. The, the i plus operating on this takes this from minus one half to plus one half, so it's going to give me one. So this is equal to minus gamma h bar b sub x times one half. And, and similarly, the, the matrix element from minus one half h plus one half is going to be the same thing. It's going to be minus gamma h bar times bx um, over two times one half. So we have off diagonal matrix elements and the Hamiltonian for this in matrix form for these two states, it can be written as E1. I'll write this thing as V, V times E2, yeah. where V is equal to minus 1 half h bar times gamma times V1. Now, Let me put in as the, the two eigenenergies of this thing. 
E1 and E2. So I think it's all minus <coughs> gamma times h bar times b naught minus omega over gamma. This is bz effective. And E2 is going to be the same thing, minus gamma H naught times um, B naught. Well, it's all, again, it's going to be, let's see, this is the plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. It's going to be plus gamma H bar B naught times minus omega over gamma. These are the energies of these two spin states in this field. Well, it's easy enough to, to I, I, I won't, the, the answer is trivial to write. It's just what we've seen before. We have this. I'm now plotting this thing over here as, say, as a function of the magnetic field B naught. I'll keep the frequencies the same, but vary the, uh, the, <coughs> but vary the uh, magnitude of the field over here. And we're going to have a crossing over here when B naught is equal to minus omega over gamma. And we're going to have a splitting over here. And this splitting over here is 2V. Well, this off diagonal element over here is just the Rabi frequency. It's the it's one half the Rabi frequency, actually. <coughs> it is the frequency with which the atom precesses around this transverse field, this Bx field. So this is 2V, and that's just going to equal omega Rabi, which is equal to gamma times, um, it, it's just going to equal gamma times B sub X. Well, the advantage of this little way of looking at things over here is now, <coughs> now we have a quantitative uh, way of telling whether or not we can invert the population. The reason it's worth inverting populations is, is that this same technique can be used in many different uh, contexts. One can use it with optically, by sweeping optical fields across resonance, or with uh, magnetic fields. The idea of, of adiabatically transforming populations is a very powerful technique for controlling atoms, <coughs> for controlling the states of atoms. And uh, this little picture over here of what goes on in the rotating coordinate system really tells you physically all that you need to know about the system. Now, I should point out there is one kind of <coughs> knotty problem, or, or potentially knotty problem, in looking at this approach, or looking at the lando zener approach altogether. Oh, yeah, let me just go back, go back here. The, the probability of non-adiabatic is that 2v squared over h bar dW by dt over here. We want that to be much less. Um, we want this to be much greater than 1. If it's, to, I shouldn't, that's not the probability. To be non-adiabatic, to go to, for, to be adiabatic. Hmm? I guess. Well, yeah, but I, I think if we're going through adiabatically, we want the probability of going through non-adiabatically very small. It means that we want this thing very large. It means you want a very large RF field, or you want to go through it very, very uh, slowly. Well, let me write this in a, in a different way. Um, 2V over H bar, that's, that is the, it's the Rabi frequency, basically. 
So what we have here is that the Rabi frequency squared over h bar, now <coughs> dw by dt, this is, this is gamma times um, mu times, um, hmm. let's see, times d omega by dt. It's gamma mu times b naught. Gamma times mu b naught. Th this is the um, th this is the resonance frequency. What this says is that omega Rabi squared over um, h bar omega naught times d omega by dt wants to be much less than one. But wants to be much greater than one or the rate of change d omega by dt, 1 over h bar d omega by dt, wants to be equal, to, wants to be much less than uh, omega Rabi squared. Now, I think I've screwed up this somehow. This should be mm -hmm. d omega by dt, dw by dt, or just h bar d omega by dt. This is simply saying that the rate at which we are reducing the effective field over here, truly the rate at which it's going over, wants to be much less than omega Rabi squared. <coughs> That's what one would get from just looking at this argument in the first place. The argument is that as, as you turn this thing over, this angle over here, the rate at which its angle is changing, has to always be small compared to the rate at which the thing is recessing around this field. And that's, that's equivalent to, to this, give or take a little sloppy algebra there. Yeah. Can we look like, suppose I have a cube? Yeah. Which is pointing this way, mm -hmm. then the cube is going to rotate in the space. Yeah. Then I send a particle, which is a cube pointing this way. Mm -hmm. Well, you're, you're talking about a, a, a part of a system rotating in space? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. No, yeah. No, it's, yeah, it's exactly true. The principles are really quite universal. Namely, the rate at which th the direction in space changes has to be slow compared to the rate at which the system is evolving around that. Yeah. So we can explain also the adiabatic following Yeah, adiabatically following a field. Yep. Shall we assign it? <laughs> no. Okay, I would like to just talk briefly about another way of looking at this problem altogether. Well, it's not altogether, definitely. <coughs> but if we look at this moment in a field, just in a static field. I have two states, say the, the plus one-half state and the minus one-half state. And here, I'm drawing the energy as a function of b naught. And the energies of these two states, well, one goes like this, and one goes like that. So there's a Hamiltonian which is equal to <coughs> minus uh, gamma h bar times i dot b is going to be equal to minus gamma h bar, call this b naught again. Uh, I'll call this m sub i, where the two values of m sub i are equal to plus or minus 1 half. So here we have these two states over here, and here is b naught. And a picture of what we're doing over here is at some field over here where we're going to do our experiment, we send in resonance radiation. We'd like to turn this thing over. So we go, we're putting in a, a, a 
frequency omega and energy h bar omega naught, which is just going to be equal to, uh, I don't know, e one half minus e minus one half. This is a picture <coughs> of, uh, of resonance, of Rabi resonance, say, where we start down here. We put in just enough energy or for just enough time that we go from here up to there. If we keep the field on, it'll go back from there down to there, and it'll cycle back and forth. But here is another way of looking at the problem. Because what we have done over here is I've drawn the pictures of the, the energy of the atom, but I've neglected the field. And Claude cohn tonuji's early vision on this was to include the field into the problem. This led to the dressed atom picture, which has been invaluable. As time goes on, it's gotten better and better. <coughs> um, and uh, when you look at the, when you include the field in it, you have a totally different way of looking at it. I might say that when I was just, just after I'd gotten my PhD um, and the early days of Mazers, we both went out to a conference at, at Berkeley, which is where I met him. And this was in the very early 60s. Um, and he was telling me at the time about ha his ideas for doing this, <coughs> that he wanted to get a quantum mechanical solution to the problem, which not only quantized the, the motion of the system, but also the electromagnetic field. And um, well, I immediately met, liked Claude when I met him, because he's a very interesting and likable person. But I thought to myself that this is a, what a waste of time because the fields that one uses in magnetic resonance, these were microwave fields <coughs> in those days, um, are totally classical. Namely, these are strong fields, countless photons in them. Why bother quantizing the field? And this gives a very good uh, indication of why Claude is a theorist I'm an uh, and I'm an experimenter, because I didn't have the vision that, that, that he did I'm not even sure he had the total vision of what was going to come out of it, but he felt that this is a better way to, to handle the problem. You'd learn things from doing it that way. And that led to the dressed atom picture, which was specifically what he was cited for in the Nobel Prize. But so we're not going to delve into that at too great length, although it'll come up a couple of times. <coughs> but what I'd want to do is to point out that if you consider what's going on with the field in here too, then at this state over here, I'll call this the ground state of the system over here, and this is the excited state, that something has happened over here that a photon has been absorbed from the radiation field. So if we look at the energy of the radiation field and take into account proper energy conservation, which would include this one photon over here, that we have one more photon in the field here than we have there. So if I describe the atom state by G, and the number of photons, say, is n plus 1, then up here in the excited state, we have just the excited state over here, and there are only n photons there. Now, suppose I look at this photon energy over here, move over to here, and now look at this state over here because this just shows the energy of the atom. It doesn't include the energy of the field. The energy of the field has moved us up to here. So then this state is going to look like, well, it'll look like that. Now we have, <coughs> this is the ground state over here and n plus one photons. And here's the excited state over here with n photons. But we know there is a coupling between these two states. In fact. We already calculated what that is. Because of that coupling over here, these two states are going to be split like that. And they're going to be split, turns out, by this matrix element 2V, which is just equal to, well, it's h bar times the Rabi frequency. Okay. So here's a different way of looking at the picture. Now, the nice thing about this picture is there's no time dependence in it at all. It's a static picture. We have a static picture of this atom interacting with the radiation field. Well, you know that the, um, 
that the radiation, that the thing is going to evolve in time. So what's happened here? Well, let's take a let's look at this thing. Suppose that suppose I start in the excited state over here, and at t equals zero, I'm going to suddenly turn on the field. So what we have over here initially these two levels appear to be crossing. And I'm s initially starting in this state over here, in that state. Okay? When I turn on the field, these two levels get mixed. I'm going to get a symmetric and an anti-symmetric combination of these two states. Right? And they have different energies. They each one energy is going to be up by uh, half Rabi frequency, the other down by half the Rabi frequency. So I turn on the field. And suddenly, I've projected my initial state into these two states over here, half the states there and half the states there. The phase of the symmetric and anti-symmetric combinations, though, is going to depend on which state I started out here. So now I have two states of different energies. Okay, and now they're going to start oscillating back and forth. They start out with such phase that, say, if the particle is over here, at t equals 0, it's there. And it, as time goes on, it's going to oscillate back and forth between these two eigenstates. Okay. If one works that out, it's exactly the Rabi frequency. So you can get the time dependence of the system if you want by taking into account the fact that you've split this degeneracy very abruptly into an anti-symmetric and a symmetric pair. And the two, the, the two pairs just kind of beat against each other, and the particle beats back and forth. It may look rather puzzling, because initially, if you start, if we go take that state and carefully adjust the field so we're over here, and then turn it on, how does it know where to begin with? And it knows where to begin with, because it remembers the phase. And it's going to be in the right combination of symmetric and anti-symmetric ones. So if I turn the field back off, for instance, adiabatically, I'd be back in that state. So this is a different way of portraying the system. And if one wants to, you can use this to calculate the transition probabilities. But the chief advantage of this is, is the simplicity and the completeness of the system, because our system is larger now. We've not imposed classical fields on as just an add-on. They're sort of built into the system. One last point I'd like to make. There is a, a potentially knotty problem with the Landau-Zener effect. Because you know, because of any interaction over here, if I start in this state over here and move over here, I will always come out over here. Even if I make the interaction smaller and smaller and smaller, as long as I go through here, I will come out over here. Suppose I make the limit where the interaction is 0. Which state do I come out in? Do I come out this state or that state? There seems to be some sort of paradoxical problem over here. It's a case where the limit of behavior as the, as the perturbation goes to 0 is not the same as the, uh, as the behavior at the limit. Because if there's no perturbation at all, you'll always go through uh, not adiabatically. But as long as it's finite, you go through adiabatically. Well, <coughs> Turns out there's a rather interesting answer to that, too. But basically, the answer is this. To go through adiabatically, you've got to go through slowly. Right? As the interaction gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you have to take longer and longer and longer to go through there. So in this limit I'm talking about, where the interaction goes to 0, your time has to be infinite. The time can't always be infinite. A very interesting case came up in Lamb's paper on hydrogen. You include radiation damping on this thing where these states are decaying. It turns out, because of radiation damping at this anti-crossing over here, since this level has some sort of width to it, like that, what happens is the width in this region over here, if the width is larger, uh, the radiative damping width is larger than the separation between these, you can actually go through, uh, you, you can go through the thing um, adiabatically, even though it, it turns out the no-crossing theorem is violated 
these two levels will cross each other if you have damping present. On the other hand, you've got to get through very quickly because they're decaying. And you're getting through so quickly that you've really lost the distinction between the levels. Well, that's just a side comment on the landau zener effect. So I think at this point, um, it's a good place to stop for the day. And yeah, once again, I didn't stop to ask for questions, although we had a few from Courageous Souls. Do we have time for any questions? If we take, it, 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 it's, well, it's, it, it's best to do it in the dressed atom picture, which is a fine way to do it. I'm starting out in this system over here, say, al along the magnetic field. Okay? And, and in the presence of an oscillating field, which is, I have a, another state over here. Okay? Now, if I go through this thing very slowly, I'm going from that state to that state. Notice this state has turned, has flipped me over in space. This, say, is the plus one half state over here. This downward going state is the minus one half state. So I've gone from this uh, ground state over here to what I call the excited state over there. The criterion for doing that is given by the landau zener effect for this type of anti-crossing. So that tells me how I can go through adiabatically. But this also gives me a different way of looking at just what's happening at that. The vector picture that one has gives you, the, uh, the, gives you a physical picture of precessing around and going down like this. This actually lets you calculate the probability that you'll be doing that successfully. So these are two ways of looking at the problem. This way, the, the, the vector way, is very handy for making quick calculations. If you really want to know where you are, then uh, the landau zener picture gives you a quantitative answer. Mm -hmm. Just to connect with the cold atoms, in cold collisions, we always have those uh, molecular levels crossing in many points. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one of the main uh, uh, reasons for like uh, fine structure change or hyperfine structure change mm -hmm. and so on. My question is, uh, I can understand that like if I have those levels crossing, and uh, if that parameter is time or internuclear separation, mm -hmm. I see these atoms flying through the cross. But if I have, if I'm very slow motion, mm -hmm. so that the De Broglie wavelength is bigger than this, is Landau's inner still good? I mean, that is a limit in terms of uh, uh, temperature or things where I can still use Landau's inner in cold tests like uh, collisions or so. Hmm. Interesting. I hadn't. <laughs> um, what would really change if you go to very cold collisions? Yeah, what like changes? Yeah. You understood the question. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we're talking about moving along a very well-defined potential. But the, 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 if the wave packet is very large so that it varies over the potential, then the, the, this idea of a potential diagram kind of breaks down. So there is a limit to apply this. There's a limit to ap applying this. Yeah. You want to explain? Yeah. yeah. The question is, suppose you have collisions at such low temperatures that the de Broglie wavelength is very large compared to the potential variations between the particles. You know. How do you describe such a collision? I mean, here is, um, here is a, 
I don't know, potential which looks like that. You know. But suppose you're coming in with a wave packet which extends like that. How do you describe this from the point of view of motion on a potential? And I think that you can't, you can't do that. You can, you can describe the evolution of this wave packet, but you can't do it by just assigning a potential at, at every point. Is that correct? No, the, the Well, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation breaks down because of different time scales for the nuclear motion and the electronic motion in general. But here the question is, you should be able to, even if the de Broglie wavelength is very large, to assign a potential to every yeah, position. Yeah, that, that's not the problem. You still have the potential. Yeah. But yeah. So you have the potential. Now you have two potential that cross in some point. Yeah. So you have two channels. So yeah. particles start the collision in one channel, and they may exit in the other channel. And this crossing can be described as a Landau's inner type of transition. But the question is if those particles are very slow motion. Mm -hmm. So you have a wave packet traveling in those potentials that are very long, then this situation may not be so convenient. Because uh, when you evaluate that the dw dt, that can be the velocity of the particle, right? If the particle is passing very fast to the crossing, the probability of uh, going uh, non-adiabatically, uh, right? If you expand more time, goes slowly, goes adiabatically. If it goes fast, may go adia non-adiabatically. Yeah, you have, yeah. Yeah, but that, yeah that isn't. No, the, the problem is you cannot describe as this motion, right? Because now you have a, a large wave packet to describe traveling in the potential. So then you, I don't think you can describe in a simple Landau's inner type. Oh, it's not the question of uh, yeah. only the value of the velocity. It's the question of the validity of consider, because now you have this wave packet that's very spread around the potential. Yeah. I don't think you can yeah. treat by passing through a crossing. You have to do a full quantum mechanics type of. Well, maybe discuss it over a beer. But again, I think uh, you can look at the expectation value of the interaction as every, every, at every point. That gives you a potential curve. So I would think the Landau Zener would work well there. Yeah. So I think it should work. OK. Well. Okay, let's thank again uh, Dan Kleppner and...